It's Rand on Real Estate with Greg Rand. Welcome to Rand on Real Estate. I'm your host, Greg Rand, on 77 WABC and WABCradio.com. I'm here with my co-host, Laura Smith. How are you? Great to be with you again, Greg. Thank you very much. Good to see you. Do I seem especially excited today? <laughs> well, you're always pretty pumped up, I have to say, but today you seem today especially I'm just, excited. I'm just jubilant today, and the reason is, and my wife gets tired of hearing me say this, is because I'm right again. Oh, I'm right my. again, well. and you're going to love it. You're going to hear. I've, I've been calling this thing right. I'm, Laura, I'm wrong about so many things, but when it comes to real estate, I'm not. This is a show, as you know, Laura, about capitalism and entrepreneurship in America. Uh, During the Great Recession, we talk about real estate investing, building wealth in the real estate market. We talk about current events. So today we've got some interesting news coming out of Washington that I'm going to clue you into. Maybe you've heard about it, maybe you've not, but I'll tell you what it all means to you. We're going to take some calls, put this number down, give us a call, get online. I expect a lot of calls today. We've been promoting this show on Facebook all day, so (laughs) a lot of my friends are lining up. Uh, 800-848-WABC. That's 800-848-9222. And we're going to do a segment uh, that I'm going to call stock options versus blue chips in real estate. And the reason I called it that is that, you know, this show is kind of the beginning of a new genre. It's it's capitalist media, business media, but it's not the typical publicly traded business media. You know, we've got CNBC out there. We've got a lot of talk show hosts that are all stock jocks. They talk about the economy. They talk about what they call the markets. You know, the markets are the stock market, the bond market, the commodities markets and all these other things and uh, and the the currency markets, whatever. Those aren't the world. That's not life. That's Wall Street. Okay, I'm all about Main Street. Main Street's where real estate is. Main Street's where life happens. Main Street's where entrepreneurs go out there and struggle every day to try to make something out of nothing in the free world. And so this being a new genre of you know, radio and media in general, uh, I still wanted to borrow some of the old Wall Street terminology. So okay. stock okay. options versus blue chips is the idea of there are different kinds of real estate markets out there, just like there are different kinds of investments on Wall Street out there. And where some people migrate towards stock options, which are more volatile, okay, you can make more money quick, which attracts a lot of people. But of course, what goes along with that is more risk. And so we're going to talk to one of the biggest real estate brokers from Las Vegas, he represents stock options today, okay? Las Vegas is about as volatile of a real estate market as you can get. Some really interesting things going on out there. I spent half the week in Las Vegas, um, and it's really funny. You know, this is the first time I've come back from Vegas in years where I feel great, meaning I didn't go out too late. I didn't, I didn't, go, I didn't lose money. I didn't go partying too hard. I just I knew I was coming in here, so I had to make sure I kept my voice in shape. And You're a good guy. I never, good boy. Uh-huh. <laughs> I never fly back from Vegas feeling good, but that actually happened last night. Mm-hmm. But I'm a little bit weird today because I took the red eye back. So okay. if I seem strange, that's that's part of the explanation. A little for loopy, it. uh-huh. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and then the blue chips. You know, what's a blue chip? A blue chip stock is IBM. A blue chip stock is GE, something that you just know is going to be here 100 years from now. You know that it's stable. It's not necessarily going to light your fire in terms of a doubling or tripling of your money, but it's stable and consistent. And we have Charlotte North, I'm sorry, Charleston, South Carolina, um, representing the blue chips today. And we're going to go into detail with both. We're going to talk to somebody who knows what's happening in the investor market in both of those places. Uh, And I'm going to try to share with you, once we understand the strategies of what investors are trying to accomplish in those places, you may be thinking about investing in real estate. Maybe you're not. Maybe the show is going to cause you to. But you're not going to go flying all over the country to do it. So you want to say, okay, Greg, that's great, but I come from Connecticut. What does this mean to me? I'm going to try to show you how you can find the same kind of trend opportunities right near where you live and work or possibly where you go on vacation. Uh, But learn how to do what the professional investors do, which is they look at the big picture first. Their first objective is to try to make sure they find a place, some piece of dirt that has a better than typical upside potential that's going to appreciate faster or at least as fast as the market overall. And then once they find that, they look for some kind of ugly duckling, some diamond in the rough that everybody is overlooking, and, um, and then they make their plan starting there. So, um, let's see. Do we have our Vegas man on the road? Okay. Brian Kruger, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Greg. Okay, very good, man. Hey, good to talk to you. Thanks for being on the line. I know that Brian has got – you're coaching Little League today or something, right? <laughs> yeah, we've got uh, – it's a beautiful day in Vegas. So, for you East Coasters, uh, don't be too jealous, but it's 70 degrees, no clouds in the sky. And uh, we're, we're evaluating 8, 9, 10 
11 and 12 year olds today. <laughs> Very good. Well, that's, that's beautiful. The real estate business is all about uh, being part of the community. So you're illustrating that for us. Brian is the chief operating officer of Caldwell Banker Real Estate in Las Vegas, one of the biggest real estate companies in that entire part of the country. And Brian, you have an interesting background because when the boom was going on, you know, a little setup, Las Vegas is going through a really tough time right now, right? Yep. I mean, you guys did a lot of overdevelopment. You had high rises popping up all over the place, luxury condos on the strip, subdivisions of new homes out there in the suburbs of Vegas. And your property values, you know, back during the, the roaring 2000s, during the boom times, we'd open yep. a paper, we'd see that New York appreciated, you know, the suburbs of New York appreciated at 10%, and Vegas appreciated at 24%. So you guys were having a wild time out there, but then it had just as wild of a decline, right? Yeah, I mean, I got here in late 2004, and I'd never seen anything like it. I mean, I had a number of big development projects, condos mostly, and, I mean, we were selling 30 to 40 a month. Uh, traffic through the sites was the biggest problem we had was just managing the amount of traffic that was coming through the sites. And between 2004 and 2007, I think there was about 135,000 new homes built by the builders, and they couldn't keep up. With the demand and the zip code I moved into, 89131, uh, was the fastest growing zip code in the country um, at wow. the time for several years. And uh, ironically enough, it has been the, the highest uh, foreclosure zip code in the country the last couple years. And so, yeah, it was definitely um, boom times. Uh, there was the whole Manhattanization of Las Vegas concept, which I know you guys are familiar with there, but all sure. these condo buildings sprouted up. Um, with really no rhyme or reason when they were charging six, seven, eight hundred dollars a foot, and with median income in Las Vegas only about fifty thousand, uh, you can do the math pretty simply, and those people can't afford to live there. So it was all predicated on investors and um, and a lot of speculators, speculators, right? A lot of speculators. Yeah. It's important to distinct to, to make a distinction there because investors value investors. They buy and they hold. You know, they try to buy low, which is where we're going to now, and they try to hold until they can sell high. Speculators try to buy and then flip to some sucker who comes along and is willing to pay fifty thousand dollars more today for something that you bought yesterday cheaper. Um, so they. 135,000 units coming on the market and a very high percentage of them being bought by speculators means some big percentage of that 135,000 properties has to be bought and then resold again until somebody finally moves in. Um, and so if you can imagine this, um, if you look at a curve, a 10-year curve of what Las Vegas real estate prices have done, it looks like the Liberty Bell. It went like crazy yeah. <laughs> straight up during the early part of the decade, crested, and then dove back down again. And it's pretty much right where it started back in 2000, right? Yeah, well, we essentially rode a, uh, put an analogous uh, point to it. We rode up a big chairlift up to the top of Mount Everest, and uh, we've been, we came down hard um, to the point where we've lost about overall about 60% of the values from peak to trough. Um, the good news is, is that the market has stabilized over the last year. I think last year we only had about 3% uh, price depreciation year over year. And so it's really started stabilizing. The affordability is unbelievable. We're the number one most uh, undervalued city in the entire country. And there's a number of reports um, that, that put that out, including uh, CNN Money, most recently just uh, about three weeks ago. And so that's really what's attracted so many of the traditional investors with the buy and hold strategy and we're working with a lot of uh, domestic groups um, international interest has really spiked um, in the past year and particularly just in the last three or four months because their currencies are so strong compared to the US dollar and there's potential bubble markets in some of these other foreign countries and they see the US overall which is undervalued by approximately three percent and Las Vegas is under 30 is 30 percent undervalued and that is creating a, a perfect buying storm um, for Las Vegas. Yes, that's interesting, is that we, we look for places where we see an overcorrection. I'm big about trying to understand the impact when you have a roller coaster ride and it goes up too fast and it comes down real hard like it has in Las Vegas, there's serious potential, particularly because of the total lack of confidence that people in this country have had in the economy over the last couple of years. That drives prices deeper. Then you have the artificial impact of the foreclosure crisis on top of that. Then you have the artificial impact of people who are walking away from mortgages that they're underwater on. And what you're seeing, so you and I talked when I was out there a couple of days ago, and you're, yeah. you're seeing people with large sums of money. You mentioned the individual investors, the professional investors who are buying to hold, but you also see some significant Wall Street capital coming in, looking to take a position in a major market um, and buying large just whole swaths of, of units, right? 
Yeah, we've we, and that's really been the, the most positive thing that I'm really getting out into, not just to our agents, but out into the market. And we do a lot of uh, pushing of uh, information through our social media channels that we're uh, very uh, proud of the, the the level we've gotten to on our social media push. But you know, we've had some some big projects. Um, one just recently was was taken down. Um, they purchased the non-performing note. Um, it was over 200 units. Um, we've seen some good land transactions. Recently, in the fourth quarter, we saw some good um, size commercial transactions take place. So when I see those type of things, whether it's from a hedge fund um, or whether it's from private um, private equity, angel investors, et cetera, that to me signifies that they believe that we're pretty much near the bottom. And, you know, I don't think anybody ever believes they can really buy and time the bottom. But as long as they're pretty close to it, um, then they want to be able to buy up as much inventory right. as they can. So those are the wolves that you watch first, yeah. When those guys are making a move, that means that they see things that other people are going to start seeing shortly. So, listen, I know you've got some kids you've got to teach how to uh, throw curveballs out there. I hear them in the background. <laughs> Not at this age, Greg. Not at this age. <laughs> okay, good. Um, hey, how do they find you? How do people find you out in Las Vegas, Brian? What's your website address? Um, our website is uh, www.com. LasVegasHomes.com. It's the most visited website for real estate in Las Vegas, and um, I can be reached personally at Brian B R I A N dot Kruger, K R U E G E R at C is in Charlie, B is in Boy Vegas dot com, and uh, would be happy to talk to anybody if they had any questions about Las Vegas real estate, what's happening, and the you know the extraordinary opportunities that currently exist. We believe there's probably going to be about an eighteen to 24-month window where these opportunities are going to exist. And then that 30% undervalued uh, piece, once we get through the distressed inventory, uh, which there still is some here that we're going to have to work through over the next two, three, four years, but once we get through a major part of that, that's when we're going to start to see that, that capital appreciation start coming into play. And the first piece is to get the prices back up to really where they should be versus how undervalued we are right now. Okay. Well, that's great stuff, man. Hey, thanks a lot for being on the show. I appreciate it. You gave us some great information. Okay. Have yourself a great day. This is Randon Real Estate on 77 WABC. We're going to go now from after the break. We're going to come back and talk about a blue chip market in the Carolinas. Stay with us. Okay, welcome back to Randon Real Estate. I'm your host, Greg Rand on 77 WABC and WABCradio.com. We're going to take your calls a little bit later on in the show. The number here is 800 848 WABC, that's 800-848-9222. And what I want to hear from you on is, are you thinking about, have you thought about, have you dreamt about being a real estate mogul in your own right? You're not sure how to go about it. I hear this everywhere I go. That's why this show is here, is to start to bring some sound, reasoned strategy out there to teach you how the professional real estate investors that I spent my career working with, how they go about doing this, which is why we jumped in talking about Las Vegas in the last segment, because what... What's interesting about that, when you hear about a catastrophic story like that, where there was all kinds of bad behavior in the last 10 years, they built 135,000 pieces of real estate for an audience that wasn't even there to move in. And why would anybody believe that that's going to somehow be remedied? And the answer really is in the big picture. If you stand way back from Las Vegas, what you see is that there are companies, not just the entertainment industry, which is growing in leaps and bounds out there, but they are diversifying their employment base, largely because of what happened in the last bunch of years. And so like a a company like Zappos, I don't know if you're familiar with Zappos. You ever buy shoes from Zappos? Yeah, absolutely. I visited their headquarters when I was out there this week. I took a tour. And they are... Uh, so you've bought shoes there. Have you returned shoes to them? I never have, but okay. I know people who do. Yeah. And they have this incredible service ethic out there, and they have this really, really high energy, um, high enthusiasm uh, corporate culture, which is why they give tours to companies who want to come and see how they do what they do. But what's more important is they chose Las Vegas, and they are poster children for building a business of young, enthusiastic people in Las Vegas. Mm. They also have a new governor who is a pro-business governor who has stated as one of his core missions to recruit companies out of California. That's right. Who just elected Jerry Brown, whose core mission is not going to be to drive companies out of California, but his actions may do exactly that because that's what that state has done for a long time. So there's a big picture view on Las Vegas 10 years out that's very, very strong. And that's the way that I want you thinking about real estate. I want you thinking about can I find something going bad right now that's explainable and temporary? And then inherent in that situation, is there a long-term picture that's actually pretty beautiful, that's very strong? We talk a lot about that short-term pain, long-term gain kind of combination because 
you know that we've just gone through a crippling recession, and you know that at some point it's going to end. I have a book coming out called Crash Boom. It's actually on the trucks right now on the way to the bookstores. You can pre-order it. If you go to ownamerica.com, you'll see Crash Boom there. You can get it at, uh, we have links there to Amazon and barnesandnoble.com. But Crash Boom is all about the inevitability of one after the other. So when you have a crash, you're going to have a boom. When you have a boom, you're going to have a crash. And then what comes next, you know, it, it just keeps rolling that way. Yeah. And when you have a really ugly crash like we just had because of a really insane boom that came before, what is most likely to happen is something fairly stable, fairly long term. Um, but this is a post correction opportunity that's happening right now. So if there are people out there that lived responsibly during the boom, that saved money, that have money on the sidelines looking for some place to put it where they can use their creativity and they can use their their brains uh, to go out and build generational wealth for their household over a long period of time, you're talking right now. You're going to look back. If you don't do anything about this, you're going to regret it, but you can't blame me because you heard me say it, right? Mm -hmm. Um, So now we're going to go. We talked about blue chips. And stock options, right? Vegas was the stock options. Now we're going to go to the blue chip area of the Carolinas. We've got on the phone with us right now. Oh, hang on. Do we have him on the phone with us? Yes. We do. Okay, Rob. Rob Woodle, you there? Greg, yes, I'm here. How you doing? Rob is from Carolina One Real Estate. That's the largest real estate company in the Charleston, South Carolina area. And we've talked about the Carolinas on this show a little bit. I'll just set it up by saying that the Carolinas didn't really have as big of a party during the boom of the Roaring 2000s, as certainly places like Las Vegas or Florida. But there are migration patterns that are moving companies and people into the Carolinas, and particularly Charleston. Um, and so what are you seeing down there? What's the vibe? How are the investors behaving? What's going on in Charleston? Well, the, the, uh, the biggest thing is we've seen the influx of Boeing. Uh, they're going to be building their new 757 planes, and we've also got another uh, wind turbine GE with our colleges here that they're going to be building here in Charleston. So the the feel right now for us is, is is strong and it's good. What the investor is seeing is that the influx of people that are coming here are not going to buy their first year. They're going to be looking to rent, and that's created a great opportunity. And with the market uh, with with the market the way it is, and the inventory of the market that we have, you know, speaking to investors, they're go, they're telling us that the quality of inventory is the best it's ever been, and uh, they are buying properties and and uh, holding them, of course, and then putting people in there. Now, it's interesting. Two things you said. One, when they say quality of inventory, what what do they mean by quality? How do they judge that? Well, I, I think it was the, the, the quality, because we have so much, you know, as a, as, as a realtor, you know, there's a lot of inventory, and we've got to move it out. The investors are looking at, at the amount of inventory that that are out there that they can pick and choose, especially if it's a REO property. And, you know, banks are working with people to clean up the houses so it's not an abandoned house and, and things are ripped out of the house. They're, there's really a great deal, and they're getting to take advantage of that. So you've got people that are coming in who are seasoned investors. They have some experience. You said that, of course, they're doing the buy and hold. But has that always been the case? Because a lot of people, you know, if you stay awake late at night and you watch some late night cable, you're going to come across one of those guys. You know who I mean, right? Absolutely. And, you know, that is an interesting aspect because a lot of people became real estate investors in 2005 and 2006. And, and they're, they were novice in it and, and they're out of, they're out of it. And the ones that were, that this is something that they worked at, this is, they have a system, they have, um, you know, what, what we like to call the cash flow positive, you know, that's a, you know, they, they looked at it, they had a business plan for this. And they went after property. When the market went hot, they had to pull back a little bit because they couldn't compete, compete with a lot of people that would get emotional with a property. And um, now that has fallen off. The novice real estate investors have gotten out of it, and they are, are reaping the rewards. So the novices had the buy and flip approach? Yeah, the buy, flip, buy, you know, and making a quick, uh, taking it, investing in something else. Well, you know, the problem with that is, is that at the end of the day, the market changed, and they were still holding that property. Right. That's a really, really important lesson for a lot of people. Buy, flip. You know, a short-term view in real estate investing is really a bad idea. This is a long-term, slow-moving behemoth. And if you're looking for something short-term, go to Wall Street, go to E-Trade. That's the way they play things. But, you know, people talk about getting rich quick in real estate. You can't get rich quick. You can make a score, right? You can buy something for 80 grand, flip it for 100, you made 20 grand. Well, 
you can't buy a Hyundai for twenty grand. You didn't get rich because you made twenty grand. So you take that, you roll into another one, try to make another twenty. Eventually, the music stops. You get caught. And instead of making another 20, you lose all of the 80 that you just previously piled up over a couple of years. And maybe you get jammed up with a property you can't sell. So I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad to hear that the professional investors felt they had to back away because they couldn't compete with the amateurs. And now that the amateurs, it's like, it's like when you go out on New Year's Eve, right? New Year's Eve, if you like to go out, a lot of people that go out a lot stay in on New Year's Eve because that's when all the junior varsity is out there on the roads. And you just don't <laughs> want to be involved in that. Same kind of principle here. Um, so you, uh, Rob, you're also an investor as well, and you told me a story before we got on the air about uh, something you bought kind of near the peak and how your outlook is on that. Well, you know, I did. I mean, I, you know, I, you know, did my, you know, what I needed to do, and it looked like a good invest. I mean, it is a good investment, but at the end of the day, I put enough down on it that, I, and then putting a renter in it, that I'm going to be okay. But it's going to be long term. It's not going to be something that. Uh, you know, two to three years that, you know, I'm going to, you know, make this big pile of money, it's going to be down the road and, and taking advantage of a, of a lot of things, of taxes and, and insurance and, and so forth, and we're going to be okay. And I think that's the approach that people, the consumer has to look at this, that, you know, this is, uh, you know, for the investor person, this is long term. It's not short term. You said that. But I, I think another issue that you've got to look at is that, we're going to have a lot of what I call white collar uh, renters that that maybe had to short sell their house or their house got foreclosed on. They got dinged on their credit. They can't go buy, and right. that's going to be an influx to people who are investors who have property that can rent to them. They make a great living. They just fell on some hard times. Well, that's exactly right. I really appreciate you saying that. I'm going to get into this in the next segment about the. Uh the increase in rental households now that home ownership is going down and how this is about as good a time as ever to be a landlord. Uh, Wilson, I really appreciate you coming on the air with us, Rob. How do people find you? Uh, you know, you can. Uh, we, we, we welcome everyone coming to South Carolina, especially <laughs> Charleston, but uh, you can reach me at 843-697-2313. Awesome. Hey, thanks a lot, Rob. Have a great day. You too. This is Rand on Real Estate. I want you to give us a call. Talk about your real estate ideas, and let's bulletproof some of your plans. Our number here is 800-848-WABC. The rest of the show, we're going to be talking to you, taking your calls. My website is ownamerica.com. My upcoming book is called Crash Boom. You can buy it there. So stay with us. We have a lot of more, a lot more cool stuff coming up. Sound garden for you there <laughs> on 77 WABC. This is Greg Rand. You'll listen to Rand on Real Estate. Our website is ownamerica.com. The station's website is wabcradio.com. We've been talking about different parts of the country and how they compare. And we have a call here from somebody from Long Island. Sharon, am I pronouncing that right? Hi, this is Sharon. Yes, how are you, sir? How are you doing? You're from Long Island and you're calling about Florida. That's great. What's your question? Um, I'm, I'm, I went to Florida last summer and uh, I was thinking of buying a property there uh, in Deltona and Devonport. I don't know how's the Florida outlook right now. I'm just trying options. Now, are you uh, thinking, that, tell me about your, what is, you know, the, the, the first step in this conversation is always what your plans are for it. Is this something that you're going to move into, something you're going to buy and rent out, or something you're going to try to... Rent, buy and rent out. I had an uncle who had, a, you know, a condo in, uh, in Orlando, so I was talking to him, and, you know, I, I was just, a first time, you know, <laughs> investor. So good. Your show really helps, you know. Good. Well, I'm really glad you called because that's you know I know a lot of people that are trying to get the courage up to be a first time investor, and I think you found something. See, I, I'm a big fan of Florida, and I'll tell you why. Florida is getting beat up in a way just like Las Vegas has gotten beat up, particularly South Florida. Not really as high up as Daytona. Daytona is kind of in the upper middle part of the state on the on the East Coast. And so the first thing you know is that it's a coast. And so, you know, there's only so much waterfront to go around, and Daytona is on there. Uh, but also, South Florida did a lot of that mad investing and developing and speculating. They built 60,000 condos in South Florida all at one time and got themselves caught in the same kind of situation as Las Vegas. And that circumstance has created a massive foreclosure crisis in Florida, which is kind of dragging down the property values in the entire state. So even though Daytona didn't see the same kind of... Uh, insane development that further down the coast did, it still got impacted by it. But you don't, like, for example, you didn't see a whole bunch of half-built high-rises on the on the beach in Daytona, did you? 
Yes, I, I'm not. I'm not talking about Dayton. I'm talking about Deltona, Devonport, oh, okay. the area around Central Florida. You know, uh, outskirts of Orlando. Okay, my apologies. I read Daytona on here. Delta. Okay, got it. Yeah. So the the central part, kind of the the uh, the planets that are surrounding the sun, which is Disney World, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, so that's interesting. What's happening in Florida in the long term is completely based upon migration patterns. All right. If you take a really really big step back and look at Florida. For the last 40 years, it has been gaining population faster than virtually any state in the country. And the reason is real simple, the climate. All right, People like it down there. It was a state that was developing slower than other parts of the Northeast. But right down that I-95 corridor, people from New York and Boston and even across into Chicago and, and, um, and Missouri, all those Northeast and Central states, people came down for the climate because it was too darn cold up in the Northeast. And what they found is paradise in America. And so that situation hasn't changed one bit. In fact, it's accelerating right now because you've got 72 million baby boomers, the largest percentage of them living in the population centers that I just named, and they're all looking at Florida, most of them, as their primary identified, primarily identified market they want to retire to. And so the 10-year, 15-year outlook on Florida is absolutely outstanding. And that's, that, that can be said for a lot of places around the country, but what can't be said for all of them is how – beaten up Florida has gotten over the last couple of years. So Florida, the entire state, is a beautiful example. I say beautiful. I don't mean to be insensitive to anybody who's losing a home in Florida when I say that, but it's a great example of short-term pain inherent in a place where there's awesome long-term gain. And that goes for the inland communities as well. I mean, what's the, what, what's the approximate price of the place you're looking at? Um. Uh- I'm still looking into it. I mean, what's an average, you know, small regular home, you know? Um, so you think it's? I mean, it's under a hundred thousand dollars, right? Yes. Okay. Now you're coming from Long Island. You know, you can't you can't buy a postage stamp in Long <laughs> Island for under a hundred thousand dollars. You can right. buy a piece of a three family house. I'm sorry, a three right. bedroom house in that community. And what's happening in Greater Orlando is they just like Las Vegas. They know they've got a a fantastic economic driver in Disney World and all the other entertainment facilities around, but they've also been reaching out to try to attract other kinds of businesses so as not to be too, too overly dependent on one, um, one aspect of their economy, namely tourism and travel. So I like it. And, you know, I like your plan because what you said out of the gate is that you would buy it. You're going to put a decent size down payment down, hopefully. If you do that, what you're going to end up with is a positive cash flow. So you meet your tenants, you get a good tenant in down there, and, uh, and you know, let them pay your mortgage down over the next bunch of years, and then you're going to find that you're going to make a fantastic return because you're going to make money along the way. But Florida is absolutely poised for beautiful appreciation over the next 10 years. Any options in southern Florida that you would recommend besides Orlando area or, you know? In south Florida, there are – well, in the price points, I'm a big fan of the west coast of Florida – um, Fort Myers area is one of the places we've talked about on this show because if you come just 10 or 15 miles inland from the coast in Fort Myers, you can buy properties that are so beaten down by this crisis um, that you can get them for under $60,000 and rent them out for a profit. So I like the West Coast. I like the East Coast also. I'm, I'm not, you know, I kind of, if it's an investment, I kind of get away from the waterfront stuff because the waterfront stuff, that's for people who want to retire there and the costs are too high to really be sure you can cover your expenses. But if you just go a little bit inland where regular everyday folks are going to live and rent from you, that's, uh, that I think is the, uh, the right way to go. So thank you, Sharon. I appreciate your call. We've got George from Manchester, New Jersey, who's got a theory on how we can fix the housing market. How are you doing, George? Good. How are you today? Good, thank you. So what are you thinking? Oh, I'm going to try and lay it out for you as quick as I can. There's about 2 million houses in foreclosure, Okay. The market is terrible because the prices keep dropping. The people that own homes have lost so much equity. A lot of these houses are destroyed. The banks got paid from the federal government. These houses aren't worth hardly anything. And the problem is the land never goes bad. So my idea is, you know, if they bulldozed a lot of these houses that aren't worth anything, put them in a dumpster and recycle that material and put those lots up in some kind of pool for a fair market value, some people can start building a house again. What it's going to do 
it's going to create the market positively where people are going to start to buy again, and the prices ain't going to keep dropping the way they have. All right, interesting. Because, so this is the this is the, the knock the houses down solution, and I've heard this tossed about a little bit. And it's an interesting idea because. Housing is a straight-up supply-demand situation, okay? We have an oversupply right now. The oversupply has to do with a lot of development in some places that we've talked a lot about already today, but also a lot of foreclosures, properties languishing on the market, and that has a way of driving down prices. Not enough demand, too much supply. So what do you do? Just knock down the supply, reduce the number of available properties on the market, and it's, it's kind of like, well, I won't give you an analogy. I'll just go straight at it. My only problem with that solution, and I appreciate it, George, my only problem with it is that it costs money. There was economic value that was put into those properties. Okay, It costs money. People were, were compensated to build them. Supplies were used to build them. Sure, you can recycle them, but once they're actually structured into a standing piece of improved property, a, you know, a structure, a home, you've, you've created some economic value there, or you spent some economic value, and then you're just going to throw it away. There is something wrong about that, the way it strikes me, and I, you know, I'd rather see, um, I'd rather see the market heal. Okay, all we really need in this situation right now, we don't have so much inventory on a nationwide basis that it's it's untenable. What we've got is a level of pessimism in the populace right now, where people are saying, "I don't want to take my money and put it at risk right now until I see something happening on the positive side," and that was six months ago. And as I've been talking about here. What we've seen over the last couple of months is a change. We've seen an increase in home sales in December, an increase in new home sales in December, increase in auto sales, decrease in unemployment, stock market jumping past 12,000. All of those things are giving us a sense that before we start tearing houses down, George, and I appreciate your call, I want to see if the market can heal in a traditional way, which is just confidence coming back and people buying real estate. All right. Thank you for your call. All right, we've got... Yeah, well, we're going to take a, a quick one and quick uh, one? Okay. and come back. We've got more phone calls for your great show, Rand on Real break. Estate. Okay, I'm getting so, su- what an education. This hang on, guys. This is Rand on Real Estate on 77 WABC. We'll be back in about a minute and a half. Thanks. Welcome back to Rand on Real Estate. I'm Greg Rand, your host. I'm here live from the Small Business Authority Studios in 77 WABC, and you can hear us on 77 ABC and WABCradio.com. My website is ownamerica.com. What we've got there for you is we're launching very shortly a series of courses, online courses for people who would like to learn how to invest in real estate for long-term retirement planning, college planning, just general wealth management, but to use real estate as the vehicle to do that. So we're putting the finishing touches on those right now. You can go and sign up for our blog or register for our program, and our first class is going to start online in uh, in April. Love to have you be there. You could also buy the book Crash Boom while you're there, and that's a... Um, a piece that talks all about where we are in this unique time in history and how I don't want you to miss it because you're going to look back and you're going to say, boy, that was a big one, and I I heard that guy Rand on radio talking about (laughs) it, and I missed it again. Um, I promised you when we first opened this up that I wanted to tell you something that came out of Washington just in the last 24 hours that was really significant, and that is that the government, federal government has decided that they want to move towards privatizing Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac again or somehow getting them out of the government's control. And I just want to say, you know, I come on here, when I think the president's doing something wrong, I say so. This is right, okay? If you're going to criticize him for overreaching and getting his grip on banks and getting his grip on on um, auto companies, well, they did the same thing with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Those were d- developed decades and decades ago as a way for the government to put a backstop in place to allow a mortgage marketplace to be created so everyday people – could qualify for large mortgages for long periods of time. You know, they invented the 30-year mortgage. And what happened, you know, they were always designed to be government-sponsored entity, uh, entities. You've heard them called GSEs. That's government-sponsored entity. They weren't designed to be government-controlled. And what happened in the, in the roaring 2000s is that Congress basically started running them. They started making the decisions on how Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were going to behave. And that's where this whole thing got started. And so in 2008, it was so bad, they actually took them all back um, and, and took control of them. Now they want to get out of that, and that's actually a good thing. And the second thing that was great in the story, front page of the Times today, is that the administration is basically going to stop encouraging home ownership, which on the one hand I think is a crazy idea, but on the other hand what they're saying is more people should just be happy being renters. 
And you know what that means? It has never been a better time to be a landlord in this country. When the first president in like 10 presidents in a row has decided that he's going to promote renting, that a home is not necessarily the place you own, it's the place you live, the place you raise your family. What that means is that they're going to, they're encouraging people just to be satisfied renting for a long period of time, which makes them good, responsible tenants. They take care of your property, they pay your mortgage down for you, and you get the benefit of the long-term wealth creation. So don't let this opportunity pass you by. We're going to jump over to the phones now. We have a couple of minutes left. Hey, um, Bob in High Point, New Jersey, how are you? Yeah, how you doing? Um, you had a couple of guests in there, and they're talking about the overvalued or undervalued market, um, like thirty percent undervalued in Las Vegas. What do you say to the people who say that that's not true, and that this is the new normal, and they may, well, there may be a bit of a recovery, but nothing near what they were. You know, it's a very good point. So, is this? You know, are the same people who told us the market was going to go great forever are now telling us, okay, the market's now corrected and now it's going to start going great again. Are they full of it? Is this the new normal? And the answer is yes and no. It's the new normal. I say, I don't think you're going to see a bounce in values for years, five years. All right. And I, I don't think you're going to see it in Vegas either. Any investors in Vegas who think it's going to bounce, I don't think they're correct. This is going to take some time to heal. And so if your question is, is this the new normal for the foreseeable future? If five years is your threshold, the answer is yes. It's going to revive eventually, though. All right. The 10 year outlook is we're going to see nice, solid appreciation. My prediction. If you look forward 10 years and then look back, you're going to see that the market appreciates at about 3.5% per year over that 10-year period. Even if for the first five years we're a flat line, we're going to make up for that. Because if you go back literally to the 1940s, that's exactly what the housing market's done. It just goes a little bit better than inflation. And so the bottom line is that the reason why I called my company Own America is that this is American housing. You actually get a deed to a piece of this country. So as long as the country's in demand, as long as we have population growth, as long as we have innovation and prosperity and all those wonderful things, property values will continue to go up. But uh, in the short term, they probably shouldn't, right? Because we're going to – if the same thing happens now that happened in the 1990s, which is we had a – 1980s, we had a wild decade. We had a big correction. We had a bank bailout. We had a big stock market crash. We had a real estate correction. And then for the most of the 90s, it kind of flatlined until like 1997, so uh, does that answer your question, Bob? We need a change of thinking in Washington if for these markets to recover. Uh, and uh, I don't see that in the foreseeable future. And what kind of change of thinking? What, what, what's uh, we have to get rid of the uh, anti-business, anti-commerce, anti-economy uh, uh, part of the uh, Congress and the White House and, and get people in there to pro growth. Well, you know what? Thank you for the call, Bob. I, I, I agree with you. And don't forget, we just did that with one branch of government. So another branch may be coming due in a couple of years, I have a feeling. But I agree with you. I, and I believe we're already turning the corner on that. So um, thank you for your call. And don't be afraid to be optimistic. You know, if, if that's the one thing this show accomplishes is that entrepreneurs are defined by their ability to see opportunities around them when other people don't. That's the difference between entrepreneurs and everybody else. And real estate is a marketplace that is a beautiful place for entrepreneurs to go and play. It's not a niche, okay? It's not like Wall Street is some big, vast marketplace and and the Internet is some big, vast marketplace and real estate is some little niche over here. Real estate is the biggest market. And if you get into what I'm talking about here, go on my site, read what I write, listen to the show, buy the book, take the class, what you're going to start to see – is that if you apply your creativity and your ingenuity and a little bit of elbow grease, you're going to find things hiding right in plain sight, opportunities for you to build serious wealth, genuine wealth for your household and your future generations right around you in your hometown and the the places that you go to work and the places you go on vacation. So I appreciate you listening to me today. I'm Greg Rand with Rand on Real Estate. This is 77 WABC broadcasting from the Small Business Authority Studios. And my website, again, is ownamerica.com. Please go on there. Write me a note. My email address is all there. Contact us. And uh, we're just happy that you're listening to us. And how about your book? You said it is coming out any second now. It's Crash, hot off the presses. Crash Boom is on the trucks, on the way to your local <laughs> bookstore. But you can order it at ownamerica.com and get it through Amazon and Barnes & Noble. So up next, we've got Living Better with Laura Smith. Laura, you want to take it from here? Oh, I'm already here. But thanks so much, Greg. And don't, don't forget... You can hear Rand on Real Estate every second Saturday 
um, at 4 p.m. Rand on Real Estate. What a great wealth of knowledge that you bring.